All right, so we're going to finish up this unit um, talking about the newborn at risk. The same way that with postpartum we had already talked about um, quite a few of the things that can occur as complications, um, we had already discussed a little bit in just the postpartum um, content review anyway. With the newborn, as far as assessments and some of the um, situations um, and interventions we've already talked about, um, this is just to expound on that a little bit further. So here we go. Well, preterm infants are particularly susceptible to um, the development of sequelae that are related to the, a preterm birth. Um, things that they can be affected by are necrotizing, intercolitis, um, growth failure, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, um, intra and periventricular hemorrhage, and a retinopathy of premature, prematurity. Um, primary reasons for this is simply because their organ systems are immature and they lack the physiological reserves um, required to allow them to survive outside of mom. Now, preterm birth, um, yeah, it's, it's responsible for about two-thirds of um, infant deaths. And we talked about preterm labor and birth in um, complications uh, last week. We don't necessarily know what exactly causes it. We know there's a, a multitude of factors that can be associated with it. But unfortunately, the end result is you deliver an infant that's just not ready to, to transition appropriately outside of the uterus. So when we've got uh, these preterm babies, you know, how do we classify them? Well, one way is we look at the weights. Um, a low birth weight is going to be less than 2,500 grams. Very low birth weight is less than 1,500 grams. And extremely low birth weight is less than 1,000 grams. So you can imagine that, you know, this little one hasn't had the opportunity to develop any of the resources that it's going to need. And it's not developed physically enough to be able to um, manage all of the work requirements that its body is going to need. Gestational age is another way that we can look at the newborn. Um, you know, we said many times when we were starting to talk about labor and delivery that preterm is a birth um, that happens prior to the completion of 37 weeks. So a mom who is pregnant all the way up to 36 weeks and 6 days will have what is considered a preterm um, infant we'll see there's classifications of preterm, late preterm in just a few moments. Now term is 38 to 42 weeks, um, post-term, uh, post-mature, post-dates, things like that are anything beyond the 42 weeks. We really don't want to keep the baby in there more than about 41 weeks before we start looking to do something. The issue with a preterm baby or two main issues. One is fetal lung maturity. So if there is not enough surfactant, if the lungs have not matured enough to be able to expand the alveoli and you know maintain um, lung function, then you're going to have a neonate who is at, at risk for respiratory distress. Um, thermoregulation, we talked about the um, neonate's ability to maintain its body temperature. Um, if it has not had the opportunity to lay down that brown fat, that's going to be one of the um, safety mechanisms it needs to maintain its temperature. And if it's preterm, it's not going to be able to do that. You know, we used to say an infant born between 34 and 36 and 6 weeks was a near-term infant. Um, but now we say late preterm because that really more accurately describes the situation. When you say near term, that almost gives you the feeling that, oh, it's okay, it's close enough, it's not going to matter. But this is still a preterm neonate that we're dealing with. So late preterm is a more um, appropriate nomenclature to use. So 34 and 0 to 36 and 7 is your late preterm infant. 
because fetal lung maturity is so, usually by about 35 weeks, lungs should be mature. So you don't really know where this um, neonate's going to fall in that. And if they're 34 to 35 weeks, then you still are running that pretty high risk for respiratory distress. Um, risk problems for this infant kind of still go along with the same thing. Thermoregulation, um, hypoglycemia, the hyperbilirubinemia, sepsis, neonatal infection, and the concern for the respiratory function. So if you have someone born in this gestational age, you know, especially thinking about respirations because our babies are respiratory driven, you know, listen to them. Are they grunting? Um, is it, you know, a hard grunt, a soft grunt? Do you see nasal flaring? Um, are the intercostal muscles retracting? You know, are they really working to breathe? Um, you want to observe for the jaundice in that first 24 hours. Look at your maternal fetal history um, for additional risk factors. You know, is there any potential for you know, hemolytic anemia? Is there um, isoimmunization between mom and um, baby? Yeah, you know, late preterm infants they they account for about 70 percent of total preterm infant population. All right, so that's statistics out of your book there. Um, but with your late preterm, kind of like in the old way we used to say, oh, they're near term because they look like they, like a term baby should, that's going to be a little bit confusing because you may have a, a neonate that truly at 36 weeks may weigh five, six, you know, almost seven pounds, which is, you know, what you would expect a term baby to look like. However, just because they look term on the outside doesn't mean that they're term on the inside. Well, as I mentioned, um, you know, in the previous slide, when you're looking at your um, preterm infant, you got to check respiratory first because our babies are respiratory driven, and if something's not working right, then they're going to be there's going to be issues. Um, you know, if you've got your very low um, low birth weight, extremely low birth weight babies, they may not have the resources to be able to tolerate um, the, you know, the work that it's going to take for um, immature lungs to be able to function. And what could start out as, you know, a respiratory distress could just turn into a full-blown um, respiratory arrest. Um, and if you're not breathing, nothing else is going to work. Cardiac function is not going to work or anything else. So you have to watch um, and listen and just see, are they using those accessory muscles? Are you hearing grunting? Are you see, seeing nasal flaring? Um, are they breathing too fast? Do they have too long of an apneic pause? Um, what's going on with that? Um, cardiovascular function will follow respiratory as long as they're breathing then um, you you know you'll have some cardiac activity um, it's not always a guarantee that it's going to work the way it should um, if you see any issues then obviously you're going to need to uh, address them and support the baby um, blood pressures in the well baby. Remember, we don't routinely check blood pressures, but if you have um, a sick baby, then you will do um, evaluation. Most of the time, it's going to be uh, external blood pressure analysis. However, if there is a central line, um, an umbilical line, then you can do internal um, blood pressures as well. Your preterm is also a significant risk for um, cold stress. It has a difficult time maintaining its body temperature for many reasons. Um, you know, it can't flex in. It doesn't have the tone to be able to curl into itself. Um, remember that fetal position where we try and hold our um, body temperature in. Um, they have an immature temperature regulation center in the brain. They have a very large surface area of skin in relation to their body weight. Um, they don't have the brown fat put down. Um, they have inadequate muscle mass activity, so they can't shiver. Um, they do have a decreased ability to increase O2 consumption, which is going to be necessary for the um, energy expenditure. And they, a lot of times, can't get in the calories that they need for the energy expenditure. <coughs> 
So all of that together makes thermoregulation a challenging thing for our preterm neonate. So a lot of times you will see these um, neonates put into a radiant warmer, um, into a closed environment, maybe an incubator. They may even be wrapped up in um, polyurethane bags, the head's exposed, but just the body, to be able to maintain that heat environment. You do need to remember, though, that um, the preterm infant is not able to sweat, and so you have to be careful when you're warming this baby because if you get them too hot, you can actually um, cause death or, and or brain damage um, to these individuals. Your preemie um, is going to have some central nervous system issues. A lot of the CNS function is going to be dependent on the gestational age. Um, there will be a predisposition to hypoglycemia, so, you know, if they're not able to either take food in um, breastfeeding or being um, tube fed or bottle fed, if they can't take anything in, then um, nutritionally they're going to be at risk for that. Um, you may see a little bit of increase in um, bleeding. They do have fragile capillaries. Um, blood pressure fluctuations um, are going to be uh, compromising to this neonate. With everything else, if perfusion isn't very good, I mean, we've talked about renal function and perfusion um, a lot, even when we're talking about our mom. You have to be careful um, to watch the neonates intake and output because you want to see are they able to take things in but are if they're on any medications or anything are they able to um, excrete metabolites and byproducts so that that lessens any risk um, for kidney damage or toxicity or anything else. There are a multitude of hematologic issues that the um, preterm neonate has to deal with. Uh, one of them is just the large amount of fetal hemoglobin. 80% um, comprises their total blood volume and they have a decreased production of red blood cells that comes from the physiologic decrease in the erythropoiesis after they're delivered. They are at risk for infection because remember they don't have a very mature immune system yet. Even at term, um, they, you know, may show a white count, but that doesn't mean they're mature white cells and that they are able to fight off an infection. So the neonate is going to be, or preterm neonate is going to be even at higher risk because not only is their um, immune system immature, but physiologically they just don't have the resources and the reserves um, to fight off an infection, even if they had an immune system that was a little bit more functional. So because of this, um, to prevent, or as best we can to prevent anything negative from happening infection-wise, we always use universal precautions with our neonates. When planning care of the um, hypothermic infant, you need to remember rapid changes in body temperature can result in apnea and acidosis. Therefore, warming should occur over a period of hours. If you're warming too fast, that can cause apnea. If you go too slowly, then that can increase your metabolic stress and oxygen consumption. Ideal rewarming should progress at about 1 to 2 degrees centigrade an hour. If you're using a warming device, it's going to be important to monitor the neonate's temp, as we've already said. Uh, a lot of times, uh, places will use an external temp probe um, that's attached to the skin, and that will continuously monitor the, um, the neonate for any um, significant temperature fluctuations or getting too hot. And remember, another option for rewarming is skin to skin. Um, skin to skin has been proven a very viable option um, for attaining and being able to maintain um, temperature in a, ne a preterm neonate. Oxygen therapy is used to supply adequate O2 for tissue perfusion and thereby decrease um, risk potential of metabolic acidosis in our neonate. All methods of delivering oxygen require that the gas be warmed and humidified before it gets to the neonate. 
If mechanical ventilation is not necessary, then the oxygen is given through an oxy hood, a nasal cannula, or continue, continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP. Mechanical ventilation is only used if the neonate can't manage breathing on its own, um, and vent settings are determined based on the neonate's um, specific needs and support. We want to be sure we don't interfere with the um, neonate's own abilities to breathe, and we don't want to mask um, seeing the neonate try to breathe on its own. So we want to put the vent settings at the lowest um, effective and supportive pressures. If you are giving oxygen to a preemie, you need to make sure that you keep an eye on the oxygen, on the O2 sats, oxygen tension. If you have too high of an oxygen tension in the premature um, baby, ultimately you can wind up with something called retinopathy of prematurity. So to make sure that you're staying within appropriate parameters, you want to um, only use the oxygen at the lowest level that you need. Make sure you take it off as soon as you can. Um, make sure you're monitoring O2 sats um, and everything associated with this to prevent the retinopathy of prematurity. Just saying that might be something y'all want to read up on a little bit. Well, we know that the preemie has immature lungs. They don't have enough surfactant to actually be able to hold the alveoli open whenever they're breathing, so they're going to be consuming a lot of energy um, every time they do breathe to reopen the alveoli. So one of the things that we can do is um, surfactant therapy. Now, there's two forms of surfactant. You've got bovine and you've got the artificial. Um, you administer it via the ET tube. How much you're going to give is of uh, the drug is dependent on which drug you're giving. Are you doing the bovine or the artificial? Um, if we're doing it for prevention of respiratory distress, then we're going to give the surfactant within 15 minutes of birth um, to those babies with a clinical manifestation of deficiency or if their birth weight is less than um, 1250. So 1,250 grams. Treatment is going to be um, given to infants who have confirmed respiratory distress syndrome, hopefully within eight hours of, um, of their being born. Now, prophylactic surfactant is going to be given to infants who are younger than 29 weeks who are pretty likely going to experience a respiratory distress syndrome. By being very diligent in the assessment and you know management of preterm labor and preterm birth, using the antenatal steroids to help promote fetal lung maturity and then using surfactant replacement has um, had a pretty significant decrease in the incidence of respiratory distress syndrome in our neonate and the concomitant morbidities associated with that. The extracorporeal membrane oxygenation therapy, or ECMO, um, is another intervention that we can use to support um, these premature babies. It's kind of like a modified heart-lung bypass machine. Um, in open heart surgery, we use the bypass machine because the heart actually stops, so the machine is circulating for it. Well, with ECMO, the heart does not stop and the blood does not entirely bypass the lungs, but the blood is shunted um, from a catheter in the right atrium um, by gravity to a pump, like a bypass pump, goes through the membrane where it's oxygenated and a small heat exchange where it gets warmed and then it goes back into the system. Um, so you get the oxygenation of the blood perfused through the body by the heart pumping, but the lungs aren't having to work to put the oxygen into the blood. So what's the point where we know that it's going to be safe to wean our baby um, off of the respiratory assistance? 
Well, if their arterial blood gases and their O2 sat levels are maintained within normal limits and the baby is able to establish spontaneous um, ventilation, that is sufficient enough to maintain acid base. So that means they're not hypoxic, not having lactic acid buildup, um, and they are able to spontaneously um, maintain their respiration, which will maintain everything else. Then we can start weaning them off. And we're going to do that in a very gradual, stepwise manner. We're not just going to turn everything off because you don't want to stress them. You want to wean them off of it. During the entire time that they're going to be weaned off, the O2 levels are going to be constantly monitored with pulse ox, um, a transcutaneous partial pressure of oxygen monitoring, and by looking at ABGs. Because the preemies um, ingestion and digestion are immature, then they're obviously going to be at some pretty significant risk of um, maintaining optimal nutrition. Also, they're going to be at risk because they don't have the nutritional stores built up that they would have had had they been able to stay in utero for the full length of time. So their um, suck-swallow activities, you know, they're not mature and coordinated enough and these mechanisms may not coordinate fully until 32 to 34 weeks and they don't synchronize fully until 36 to 37 weeks. Um, initially, the sucking is not accompanied by the swallowing, so um, esophageal contractions are not coordinated. But even more than that, the gag reflex may not develop until their 36 weeks gestation. So these babies are going to be at risk for um, aspiration syndrome and aspiration pneumonias. So what we're going to give them, um, really the amount and method is going to be determined by the size and condition of the baby. We're going to give it either um, parenteral or enteral or even a combination. Human milk we know is going to be best for the baby because it is created to be digested by the infant. So it's going to be less challenging um, for the neonate to be able to take in. However, you may need to use um, breast milk substitutes. While they are not breast milk, they, the companies that have devised them have tried to make them as nutritionally sound and balanced and as close to what um, breast milk actually is to be able to provide the caloric needs as well as the vitamins and you know um, the substance and the support for the neonate. There's been enough um, research that evidence supports um, early introduction of parenteral nutrition, specifically amino acids, your um, lipids, your proteins, um, and the introduction of minimal enteral feedings. Do this within the first five days of life. These interventions do help neurodevelopmental outcomes improve, and it can prevent growth um, failure that's associated or witnessed in extremely low birth weight infants. It's going to be important to watch um, elimination. Um, specifically, you're wanting to watch stool because you don't want to have any necrotizing intercolitis in in these individuals and they are at risk for this. It typically will happen once the feedings have been introduced. Um, it's an inflammatory process in the GI mucosa. Um, perforation is a complication associated with that. Um, signs really aren't very specific but um, your GI things you're going to watch for abdominal distension, um, increasing or bile stain residual um, gastric aspirates, Grossly bloody stools with abdominal tenderness and erythema of the abdominal wall are things that you want to be aware of. If you see that, then you're concerned about necrotizing intercolitis. Um, gavage feedings, just remember low and slow. Okay, so if you have to do a feeding tube, and we've got a slide that will show you how to measure that, but just know when you're instilling it, you need to make sure that you are going... Um, low and that you're doing it slow. Non-nutritive sucking in the neonate um, is good and bad. Sometimes the sucking can um, mask the the urge and the need to feed, but the sucking is a self-soothing kind of um, concept in the neonate. So you do want to be aware of what your feeding patterns and your hunger cues with your neonate are um, and the ability to um, pacify them with the non-nutritive sucking. 
NRP is the American Heart Association's um, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, I don't want to say brainchild, but just their approach to um, neonatal um, life support, the same way you got CPR, BLS, ACLS on the adult. Because babies are respiratory driven, the schematic says you've got to give the baby 30 seconds to figure out what it needs to do. Um, you know, if it's going to start crying, then you should see other things um, coming into play. So in that first 30 seconds, the baby's going to come out, you're going to dry and you're going to stimulate. It's not patting it on the feet or patting it on the butt, just taking a towel and drying it off so that it's not wet and um, potentially getting caught. Cold, but that will also stimulate the baby. If it's term, if you know the fluid was clear, it's breathing, crying, good muscle tone, then you're just gonna um, wait until your minute's up, and then you're gonna do your APGAR assessment and assign a score. If Doing that does not seem to um, get the baby breathing and moving. You know, make sure they're warm. Make sure the airway is clear. You may need to use a bulb syringe. Um, continue to dry, stimulate, maybe reposition so that they're breathing. If they're breathing, their heart rate's over 100 and they're pink, you're just going to watch them. But if their heart rate um, is less than 100, or they're cyanotic, not pinking up, then you're going to need to give them supplemental oxygen. Um, positive pressure ventilation for 30 seconds, a lot of times is all you need. That forces the lungs open, gets them to breathing on their own. The heart rate should come up over 100, and you're going to be good. If they pink up, then you're going to just observe them. Sometimes nurses will do a little what we call blow-by, which is not put the oxygen directly over their, you know, mask directly on them and hold it there. They'll just let it be adjacent to so that oxygen is, quote-unquote, blowing by the face. Now, if they're not breathing well and their um, heart rate is less than 60, you're going to do the positive pressure ventilation and you're going to start chest compressions. So heart rate less than 60 is going to give chest compressions. If you do positive pressure ventilation and you're doing chest compressions and, and nothing comes up, the heart rate doesn't come up over 100, they're not breathing on their own, then you need to... Um, start considering respiratory um, support. Are you going to need to um, intubate? Are you just going to be able to do rescue breathing? And are you going to need any medications? The O2 SATs have actually been um, modified as parameters for when you start doing um, things with when you start giving the oxygen. It used to be that if the baby didn't quote unquote pink up right away, then you would go ahead and you'd put the oxygen on them. Well, now we know you don't do that. You've got to give them, you know, their 30 seconds to start breathing. Also, we don't go ahead and give them 100% oxygen. We um, will start them off at 21% um, and we use a blender so that they're blending room air and oxygen because we don't want to overload their oxygen. Remember we talked about the um, retinopathy of prematurity and the oxygen tensions being too high because um, the um, neonatal resuscitation guidelines changed and we're not using those that high dose of oxygen even on our preterm babies we've been able to keep their um, O2 sats maintained a little bit lower and even on our extremely low birth weights sats 85 percent to 93 percent but not going over 95 percent are water recommended the retinopathy of prematurity and the bronchopulmonary dysplasia rates have been reduced in infants whose arterial sat levels were kept between 93 and 95 percent. So we're no longer going and blowing 100 percent O2 um, unconditionally in these babies and because of that we're seeing the retinopathies decrease. For measurement of gavage feeding tube, you're going to go from the tip of the nose to the earlobe and to the midpoint between the end of the xiphoid process and the umbilicus. The baby's nose should face the ceiling when the measurement is done. Now, tape may be used to mark the correct length on the tube. 
when you're getting ready to insert the feeding tube, you're going to lubricate the tip um, with sterile water and gently insert it through the nose or the mouth until uh, the predetermined mark that you've measured has been reached. Um, placement of the tube in the trachea will cause the infant to gag, cough, or become cyanotic, so you'll know if you're in the right place or not. To check placement, you're going to um, pull back on the plunger to aspirate stomach contents. Um, lack of aspirate or fluids not necessarily showing improper placement, but aspiration um, and re of respiratory secretions can be mistaken for, so for stomach contents. You can look at the pH um, and you'll be able to determine if it's stomach or not. Injecting a small amount of air into the tube while listening for gurgling. Um, with the stethoscope, um, make sure you ins uh, ensure that the tube is inserted to the right mark. Air entering the stomach may be heard even if the tube is positioned um, above the um, cardiac sphincter. You can do an abdominal or chest radiography. This is really the only definitive way to verify that the tube is in the proper placement. If you are going to be using this tube for feeding, which why else would you put it in, um, you have to assess placement um, every time that you're going to do a feeding before the feeding occurs. You can use breast milk or formula um, when you're doing this type of feeding. Um, the amount of fluid and the type of fluid is recorded with every syringe change. Um, Volume of continuous feedings is recorded hourly and residual um, aspirate is measured before each feeding um, happens. Be careful when you're advancing the feedings that you don't advance them too quickly because if you do, you're going to see vomiting, diarrhea, um, abdominal distension, and apnea. Um, parents should be encouraged to interact by talking and making eye contact with the baby during the feedings to help promote that bonding and attachment. All right, so for skin, I mean, we learned about this when we were talking about our term baby. The vernix is actually very beneficial. It's a um, protectant for the skin, acts as a barrier to keep bacteria and organisms out and keep um, fluid in so it decreases that transepidermal water loss. When you're thinking about um, your environment in a NICU, the noise level in a NICU is about 20 decibels higher than a well baby nursery. So that's a lot of noise that the um, preterm neonate gets exposed to. And an increased noise level um, has been correlated with incidence of intracranial hemorrhage. It's important that the babies um, get into a well-defined sleep-wake cycle or try to develop that. Um, one way that they can do that is the NICU should establish um, day-night um, time patterns. So have it bright during the daytime but then have periods of darkness. It may be covering the baby's eyes or covering the incubator or the bassinet or the crib, turning all the lights down. Something to give a defined daytime and nighttime to help with the sleep and um, it's promoted that the baby should have a minimum of a 50 minute undisturbed um, period of time so that they can have that um, complete sleep cycle in that 50 minutes. Too much stimulation is going to be bad for the neonate. We've already discussed that. Um, they can habituate and turn away from it and that can damage them developmentally. If you have them secured um, the you know facilitated tucking, the containment, having them bundled up, um, that's going to just kind of promote a, a sense of security and that will also enable um, certain procedures, heel sticks or things that could be painful. They, they can actually tolerate that better because they have a sense of security whenever they're bundled. So you've seen the babies wrapped up like little burritos. That's actually a soothing kind of thing. Um, skin to skin is definitely been shown to um, enhance developmental outcomes. Um, Babies in skin to skin remain more calm, their vital signs are stable, their um, 
will to live and thrive is um, exponentially increased. If you have um, a multi-gestation um, delivery, so you've got twins or trips, it's been shown that co-bedding, so putting twins in the same bassinet, actually helps them um, developmentally, um, keeps them stable more. They remain more calm if they're with the same um, twin that they were with in utero. All right, it's going to be really hard to determine and predict just what the growth and development potential on a preterm baby is going to be. Um, if they are very early gestation preterm, if they are very low birth weight, then they're going to have um, more associated risk for the negative sequelae of necrotizing intercolitis, um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, CNS problems. So the longer the baby can stay in, the more the baby can weigh, the less likely it is to have those things. And so you're going to have um, better growth and development potential. If you're looking at milestones, like your motor milestones, um, you know, the moving, the crawling, the vocalization, um, you know, just body growth in general, you can't expect a preterm baby to meet the same milestones at the same level, same rate, so to speak, as a full term baby. So uh, what we will do until they're about three years of age is we will correct um, for the gestational age as opposed to the chronological age to be able to more accurately depict when those milestones are met. So how do you do that? So the example in your book is this. Say you have um, a preemie that by the calendar is six months old today. Okay, so a pregnancy gestation full term is 40 weeks. Say this premature infant was born at 32 weeks. So if you subtract the week's gestation it actually had from what a term would be, so 32 weeks out of 40 weeks gives you eight weeks that it was not in utero and allowed to develop. Well, eight weeks is going to be the equivalent of two months of gestation. So you've got a six-month chronologically aged um, preterm infant, you're going to take away those two months that it was not in gestation, so that gives you a corrected age of four months. So in actuality, this neonate that by the calendar is six months old, gestationally is only about four months old. So by correcting for the gestation age, you can get a better depiction and understanding of is my baby meeting the growth and development potential and milestones that it should be for the age that it is. When you're considering parental adaptation to a preterm infant, um, the parents must accomplish several psychological tasks before effective parenting can evolve. Um, these tasks would include you know, dealing with the special needs of a preemie, structuring the environment to meet those special needs, um, dealing with personal issues, maybe a sense of failure by not carrying the pregnancy to term and delivering a healthy baby, and the anticipatory grief over the, the possibility that they may lose the premature infant. Now, not all parents are able to form um, the bond and go through attachment to a preemie who had to be separated and segregated from them um, at birth because the preemie needed, you know, intensive care therapy. So constant surveillance and monitoring, which means the parents couldn't be with um, the baby 100% of the time. As a result, there is a higher incidence of emotional and physical abuse um, that can be manifested through detachment, um, disinterest in the baby, you know, overall neglect, whether it is emotional neglect or, you know, physical um, neglect, not feeding it, not caring for it, not maintaining um, hygiene, and, and, you know, a physical harm, um, even something that, you know, just to maybe their mind seems, okay, nothing bad, I'm just pushing the baby away, it's a premature baby, it's not as resilient, something that, for lack of a better word, simple, could be harmful. Um, 
And there's always the possibility that as an end result, the parents may completely reject that this is their child. All right, so moving into our post-term infant. Um, meconium staining occurs in about 10 to 15 percent of births. Primarily your term um, pregnancies and your post-term pregnancies, those that go um, beyond 40 weeks. While most babies who have meconium staining have no signs of depression, each baby is going to require close surveillance. Um, when they are born, you need to make sure you do an initial overview of the neonate. You want to make sure that they're moving, they're breathing well, you know, they're active. If they are, if you have something that we call a vigorous presenting baby, then leave them alone, let them clear their airways on their own. If the baby is not vigorous, then you're going to need to do suction. Um, it'll be an endotracheal tube down, you'll put the suction down, and then you'll pull out the ET tube with the suction device at the same time to um, aspirate the meconium out. If the meconium isn't removed by either you and suctioning or the baby itself, um, the meconium can enter the terminal airways and you can get um, meconium aspiration syndrome and an aspiration pneumonia. Treatment of these babies um, who have the meconium aspiration will, if it includes surfactant, you're going to see a reduction in the degree of respiratory distress or failure that the babies have. You will see an increase in their oxygenation um, and there should be a decrease in the need for ECMO. If the meconium was aspirated while the fetus was in utero, then there may be the development of persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn or PPHN. Now combined findings um, of pulmonary hypertension, right to left shunting, um, and a structurally normal heart are what you can expect to see. PPHN is often also referred to as a persistent fetal circulation, pretty much due to the reversion of the fetal pathways for circulation. Um, any interference with the normal transition of the fetus to extrauterine life um, may also precipitate PPHN. Persisting symptoms of or presenting symptoms of cyanosis and tachycardia will progress um, sometimes quickly, very rapidly, to severe respiratory compromise and acidosis. Um, the acidosis because they're hypoxic from their respiratory compromise. The management is going to be de um, determined pretty much based upon what the cause of the um, persistent pulmonary hypertension may be and you treat the underlying cause, you treat the PPHN. All right, so your small for gestational age or SGA baby is one who falls under the 10th percentile for weight. Caring for the SGA is going to be based on the presenting problem and the care is going to be pretty much the same thing as if it were a preterm infant. Perinatal asphyxia um, occurs in the IUGR neonate, probably, uh, well, really related to the fact that in utero, the utero placental perfusion was not adequate enough for the fetus to lay down the um, amplitude of fetal reserves that are necessary for the continued periods of hypoxia that are brought on by labor. So because the fetus does not have those extra reserves, um, it is going to have the perinatal asphyxia from the hypoxia. Because of that, resuscitation and support may very well be needed um, in the delivery room. Your high-risk neonates are at risk for both hypo and hyperglycemia. Now, hyperglycemia is going to be a risk with your very low and extremely low birth weight babies because of the dextrose concentrations that's found in the parenteral nutrition. The hyperglycemia can result in cellular dehydration and intraventricular hemorrhage, so it's going to be very important to watch um, these babies' glucose levels. 
We've talked about the risk for heat loss with preemies, and the same is going to go for your SGA babies. Now, your large for gestational age, or your LGA babies, are the ones that are above the 90th percentile, and they have a greater risk for morbidity um, as compared to the SGA baby. And due to their size, they're at greater is risk for birth injury and trauma. It is important to remember that with an LGA baby, um, he still may be preterm because it's not the weight that determines age for gestation but, and term, but how long they were in the uterus. The degree of risk for the infant of diabetic mothers, or IDM, is directly related to the degree of disease and the effectiveness of glucose control in the mother. There are uh, many potential problems that the neonate may encounter. Congenital abnormalities are seen in somewhere between 7 and 10 percent of IDM births. These neonates, uh, the IDM neonate, may well be macrosomic, um, and this can lead to an increased risk for birth injury or trauma. Injury and asphyxiation will occur in about 20 percent of babies born to gestational diabetics and 35% of infants born to diabetic mothers. Respiratory distress syndrome is due to the diminished synthesis of surfactant, um, and that's related to the high fetal serum insulin levels. In later pregnancy, the maternal insulin can't keep up with the maternal glucose, so you will have maternal hyperglycemia. With the maternal hyperglycemia, that's going to cross over to the baby, and so you'll have fetal hyperglycemia. The problem is maternal insulin does not cross the placenta. So you have high levels of maternal glucose going to the fetus. So this triggers um, hyperplasia of the fetal pancreas, and then you have subsequent hyperinsulinemia. So when the maternal glucose source is discontinued, i.e. the umbilical cord is clamped, cut, the fetal hyperinsulinemia will then cause hypoglycemia. So too much activity in the fetal pancreas removes the circulating glucose, so you have hypoglycemia. Okay, make sure you understand that. The two cardiomyopathies that we need to talk about are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where there is a hypercontractile and thickened myocardium or non-hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy where the myocardium has a poor contractility and it's overstretched. The um, infant of diabetic mother will have a higher than normal um, red blood cell count. Um, we call that polycythemia. The polycythemia will give the baby a red, ruddy appearance, and it also increases blood viscosity. So the more viscous, thicker blood um, will have an impairment in the circulation. It's not going to circulate as easily. As those red blood cells lice and break down, then the heme component increases the bilirubin that the neonate um, subsequently has to clear out and if the neonate is unable to effectively do this you are going to have um, a resultant hyperbilirubinemia and jaundice. Acquired and congenital problems are conditions or circumstances superimposed on the normal course of events associated with birth and the adjustments to extrauterine life. Now, most birth traumas are avoidable if proper assessments and planning have occurred. Now, some injuries cannot be anticipated, such as um, broken bones, pneumothoraxes, um, brachial plexus injuries, subsequent herbs palsies, those things that you see with a shoulder dystocia. Um, you may have a facial nerve paralysis that results from um, improper placement or too forceful 
of a use of forceps with an assisted delivery, or the cephalohematoma that occurs from using um, the vac vacuum to assist the delivery, or even an inadvertent laceration because of an emergency cesarean birth. As a nurse, you're going to be responsible for detailed and continued assessments of the neonate and education to the parents on just how to handle and care for this healing neonate. Now, sepsis continues to be the leading cause of neonatal morbidity and mortality. Um, remember that your neonate does not have an, a mature immune system, so there is going to be the increased risk for infection just in and of itself. Neonatal infections can be acquired either in utero or after birth. Your early onset sepsis occurs in the perinatal period. Your late onset sepsis occurs um, seven, between 7 and 30 days of birth. Bacteria enter the neonate through varied sites such as um, mucous membranes with the eyes, ears, nose, and throat. Um, it can get in through the umbilical stump, um, through skin defects, or internal systems like your respiratory, urinary, GI, or nervous systems. Bacterial organisms um, that affect the, um, or that cause the sepsis would be your GBS, your group B strep, E. coli, and E. coli is a pretty common um, organism, the Klebsiella, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia trachomonas. Your viral infections that are acquired while mom is pregnant um, and may, you know, may lead to miscarriage, IUGR, anomalies, or um, if the pregnancy goes forth, you may have neonatal disease. These infections include um, cytomegalovirus, um, herpes, rubella, and toxoplasmosis. Viruses um, that may be acquired outside of mom, so not um, while she's pregnant, um, these you happen to see a little bit more often in the NICU, and that's going to be your RSV and your varicella. When you're thinking about sepsis and your neonate, remember that pneumonia is the most common form of neonatal infection. To prevent or, and or manage um, infections with our neonate, you know, effective hand washing, universal precautions, those are standard for any health care situation, but definitely in the situation where you've got um, a compromised immune system in response. Um, Make sure the equipment that you use is clean. Um, you replace, use things. Make sure that the equipment is functioning appropriately. Um, follow the um, visitation guidelines. And you know, I know Grandma wants to get in and see that baby so badly, but follow the rules. Um, you don't want to expose the baby to any additional outside organisms. I want you to um, just go into your book, look at tables 20, um, 24, 4, 6, and 7, and just look over the um, birth traumas and the um, sepsis and infections. I've touched on the ones that are you know, kind of commonplace and important needs to know, but I want you to review all of them um, for familiarity. Now, maternal habits that increase risk to the fetus and neonate includes drugs, alcohol, and smoking. While marijuana appears to be becoming almost commonplace practice, unfortunately, um, say, people say it's no different than smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol, which are illegal. I mean, marijuana is still an illegal drug at least in Alabama, and there are high risks associated with it. Marijuana use um, leads to IUGR, you see meconium staining um, at birth, and the baby can possibly have some tremors. Cocaine use has also increased, and in pregnancy, we know the cocaine use can cause placental abruption. Um, after delivery with the neonate, the cocaine use can lead to hyperstimulation, hyperreactivity of the baby, 
preterm birth, small for gestational age, and you may see developmental delays. So, unfortunately, recreationally, marijuana and cocaine seem to be the two most common things that um, pregnant mothers, for lack of a better word, may indulge in. Now, your tobacco use, um, that causes preterm birth, small for gestational age, IUGR, and it also increases the risk of SIDS. It's important that moms understand, you know, the impact that not only firsthand their smoking is, but secondhand and thirdhand smoke as well. Fetal alcohol syndrome is um, an alcohol-related birth defect and is easily identified by small eyes, uh, thin upper lip, and short nose of the neonate. Um, your alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder will consist of cognitive, behavioral, and psychosocial problems, um, but you really aren't going to see the obvious defects um, as you see in fetal alcohol syndrome. So, you know, the identifying characteristics, small eyes, thin upper lip, and short nose, in the ARND, you're not going to see that. Um, sometimes it's only the mom's history and her practices that will cue you in to what's happening with the neonate. Now, drugs with oxycodone being abused by mothers late in pregnancy is uh, kind of a, a becoming more of a commonplace thing that you see. So, you know, they're thinking, well, it's a prescription medication, it should be okay, but if you abuse that, then that um, increases your neonatal risk. If you are addicted to the opioids, then you may go into methadone treatment, but um, mothers who do methadone treatment may still have babies who exhibit withdrawal symptoms um, the same as if she were on illicit or other prescribed opioids. Neonatal alcohol syndrome is a term used to describe a set of behaviors exhibited by the infant who was exposed to the chemical substances in utero. The NAS scoring system is used to assess withdrawal symptoms in the um, NAS-affected neonate. So the neonate um, with NAS will not feed well, um, will demonstrate CNS disturbances um, such as irritability, and generally is going to have a very high shrill cry. Other signs and symptoms um, that you might see will be detailed in the NAS scoring system um, shown on page 787. So just take a look at that and kind of read over it. Um, care of these babies will include controlling the environment in order to reduce um, extraneous stimuli and you want to try and keep the neonate as calm as possible. You know, so the swaddling, the holding, the shushing, all of those things to help um, to help keep it calm and relaxed down. Because feeding is a concern, remember we said they're poor feeders, you want to allow the baby to eat whenever she exhibits hunger cues. If you are looking at pharmacological interventions, you can um, you know, anticipate seeing um, possibly methadone, I may use morphine, and phenobarbital. Hemolytic diseases occur when blood groups of mother and the newborn are different. Um, you will see RH incompatibility, um, ABO incompatibility, or there may be other hemolytic disorders. Um, what the whole process occurs when maternal antibodies are present um, naturally or they form in a response to antigens from the fetal blood crossing the placenta and entering the maternal circulation. So with ISO immunization or RH incompatibility, um, it only occurs in an RH positive fetus born to an RH negative mother and the mother develops antibodies against the fetal blood cells. Your ABO incompatibility occurs when naturally occurring anti-A or anti-B antibodies cross the placenta from mom who has blood type O to the fetus who has blood type AB or AB. 
Now, if this does occur, exchange, exchange transfusions may be needed, but it's not a commonplace occurrence. Hyperbilirubinemia is a common finding with your ABO incompatibility. The most common medical problem associated with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency is going to be hemolytic anemia, which occurs when the red blood cells are destroyed faster than the body can replace them. Um, and this is a significant cause of mild to severe jaundice in your newborns. Um, you can see the exaggerated jaundice anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. The management of the jaundice will be the same. Now, um, other metabolic and inherited conditions that increase hemolysis and may cause jaundice would be your galactosemia and your um, hypothyroidism. Your congenital anomalies are reported to occur in 2 or 3% of live births, and the rate of occurrence is actually higher in fetuses that are aborted. Um, Think about why we see miscarriages or other medically needed um, pregnancy terminations. You know, uh, early pregnancy loss, we said, is usually due to some chromosomal abnormality. The fetus wouldn't make it anyway. Um, if you have a medical termination, it's because there is an anomaly that the fetus would not be compatible with life or have severe compromise did it make it um, that far. The anomalies are also the leading cause of death in infants under one year of age and accounts for about 20% of neonatal deaths. Now, in your central nervous system, the neural tube defects um, to consider are your en um, encephalocele's, anencephaly, your spina bifida occulta, or spina bifida cystica. That will include your meningeal seal and your myelomeningeal seal. So the spina bifida are the neural tube defects that most people bring into forethought. Um, and encephaly, typically those are not compatible with life um, for very long after birth. You hear rare instances where um, the child may live for months up to a year. But focusing on your um, spina bifida cystica conditions, your meningocele and myelomeningocele, it's going to be very important to protect that sac that's covering the defect um, because the sac is going to contain you know, cerebrospinal fluid, um, the meninges, and in the myelomeningocele, you'll also have nerves. Positioning is going to be very important with the neonate because you don't want to rupture the sac and you're going to have to care for the sac making sure you keep it moist and covered. Surgery is what's going to be used to correct this defect. Now your tetralogy of Fallot, um, you will have four malformations. You will have a pulmonary stenosis, an overriding aorta, a ventricular septal defect, and right ventricular hypertrophy. Transposition of the great vessels occurs when your aortic and your pulmonary artery are switched, and a PDA occurs when the shunt between the pulmonary artery and the aorta doesn't close. Surgery is required to fix a PDA. If the urinary meatus is under the glands um, of the penis or anywhere along the underside of the penis, then we refer to that as a hypospadias. Conversely, if the meatus is on the dorsal surface, it will be an epispadias. Now, an epispadias isn't as common a finding as a hypospadias. Your ambiguous genitalia results from abnormal sexual differentiation. So you may see um, in a female an enlarged clitoral hood that looks very similar to a penis. Or in a male, you may have a bifid scrotum that resembles labia. Anom anomalies of the um, GI that you worry about are going to be your cleft lip or your cleft palate, um, which results from a failure of the primary palate to fuse um, closed. 
surgical repair of a cleft lip um, occurs pretty early, around three months of age. Um, palate repairs will occur later on, um, 14 to 16 months for the hard palate and 18 months for the soft palate. Um, the difference in an omphalocele and a gastroschisis is whether or not the extrusion of the abdominal content and the herniation is covered by a sac. Um, with your um, phallocele, you're going to have um, things encased, so think CELE um, as kind of like your cue there. The gastroschisis is actually a defect at the um, umbilical insertion site, the umbilical ring, and you have full herniation of um, abdominal content, intestine, through, um, usually it's to the side of um, the umbilical ring, and those babies will need to be delivered by a cesarean birth. With um, an imperforate anus, what you see is a defect where the opening to the anus is either missing or blocked. Um, sometimes you can even have a sinus or a tract um, of the rectum going to the perineum and not anywhere near um, the anus at all. We um, discussed musculoskeletal abnormalities a little bit in previous chapters. Your club foot, you know, your feet rotate medially. Um, you're going to need corrective surgery and rehab. Um, the treatment for polydactyly will include surgery if there is bone present in the extra digit. With any of the congenital abnormalities, nursing care and management is a, a collaborative approach. Um, in many instances, surgical intervention is going to be necessary. And while morbidity and mortality um, is higher in infants as opposed to older children and adults who are having to undergo surgery, advances in surgery techniques, um, assessments that we make, pain management, and anesthesia care um, has been shown to um, promote a reduction in surgical risk to the neonates. So what kind of support and education are we going to give to the parents? Well, one thing that's important is to help them see the infant rather than focus on the equipment because it can be very overwhelming for the parent. Um, explain normal characteristics for an infant at that gestational age and encourage them to express you know their feelings about the pregnancy, the labor, the birth, just their situation. You want to be sure to observe what is said you want to see how they're acting. You want to be assessing the parent's perceptions of the infant, and you want to determine um, the level of involvement in the neonate's care. Remember, we talked about earlier, you know, the the possibility that the separation, uh, you know, and the limited, you know, actual physical contact that the parents and the neonate may have can sometimes um, lead into the physical, the emotional abuse, and the rejection of their baby. You want to make recommendations and referrals as appropriate to support, um, to support groups and local agencies. Your sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, is more likely to occur in your preterm infant. Um, Infants discharged from the NICU are twice as likely to die in their first year. Because of that, you need to be able to intervene as much as possible in the home setting. So parents need to be able to adequately perform CPR. So whether they take CPR at the hospital or the fire station, the police station, a local church, they need to be able to identify and initiate, you know, any type of resuscitative measures um, until trained personnel can come um, and take over for them. It's also going to be important to um, remind parents about the correct position for putting the baby down. Um, and remember, we go back to sleep, so we put the baby on the back. The crib should have a firm mattress, and there shouldn't be extraneous things in the crib. So, no bumper pads, no toys, no extra linens or, or bedding. Durable medical equipment should be delivered to the home before the baby arrives so you can make sure everything's working properly and the parents understand how to use it. 
Um, be sure necessary immunizations have been given before discharge and that parents are aware of the schedule for subsequent vaccinations. If the neonate is delivered in a facility that is not equipped to handle high-risk babies, then he may be transferred to a tertiary care center. You need to make sure parents know exactly where their baby is going, you know, how to get there, the name of it, the address. Um, they need to understand when they can see the baby, you know, what the visitation policies are and what other rules um, that the center has, you know, whether it's lodging or um, parking or anything that to you or I may not seem that significant, but to them could be, you know, pretty pretty paramount to them getting to their baby. Most of the time the infant will discharge from the tertiary care center. However, there may be times when the baby is transferred back to the original facility. Um, make sure your parents receive full education um, of how that transfer will occur and that they get reassurance regarding the clinical practice and care strategies between the facilities, so in transport, um, and that going back to that initial facility, you do still have qualified caregivers there um, taking care of their baby. So grieving can stem from a lot of different things. It doesn't have to be a loss from a fetal demise or a stillborn, an actual death. It can be losses of what was hoped for and dreamed about, you know, what the plans for the family unit was. The woman who was not able to carry her pregnancy to fruition, so she had a preterm labor and birth. She may, you know, feel a loss of the control and grieve over not being able to make the decisions on how the rest of her pregnancy should go. The woman who had a dystotic labor and a failure to progress and had to have a cesarean birth. Um, a lot of times those women um, will feel a loss and sense of grief over not having a normal birth experience. The parents who have a child born with an anomaly, um, a defect, they will grieve over the loss of their perceived, you know, ideal child, something that they never actually tangibly had, but it is a real perceived loss because it's what they, in their minds, owned. So as nurses, what is our role um, whenever we are helping parents grieve over a loss? One of the big things is to just actualize the loss with them. Um, you know, don't discount it. Don't poo-poo it away. Don't make, you know, false comments or things that we think are supportive like, well, at least now they're in heaven and, well, God has another angel and you can always have more. I mean, we think we're being nice, but those are actually more hurtful and damaging of comments than anything. We need to be there. Sometimes being silent is the best support that you can give anyone, okay? They know that you're there if they need you, but sometimes they just need to process things on their own. If they are you know, struggling with decisions, um, whether it's to see the baby. I mean, if it's a loss, um, you know, there's, everybody always takes pictures of their babies before they go home, but some, if you've had a stillbirth or a fetal demise, you, you know, you may not want to have the pictures right then, and that's okay. You support them with that, but you keep those um, avenues and those options open for the parents. Um, help them acknowledge and express their feelings. You know, if they want to cry, let them cry. You know, don't give them tissues and, you know, try and stop their crying. They need to express their grief. If they're angry, let them be angry. Let them work through this process. Facilitate the coping that they have. While she may not have a living, breathing child, she is still a woman who has just undergone a, a delivery. So she will still have those postpartum care needs that the woman who is, you know, in 
two rooms down nursing her baby may have. This woman is still going to have the risk for hemorrhage. She's still going to have the lochia. She's still, you know, going to have breast milk, you know, possibly coming in. So you still need to meet those physical needs. You know, I mentioned that mothers, you know, typically taking the pictures of the baby in the hospital, everybody wants to do, but if it's a loss, then what? Well, you know, offer to still have pictures made. There are a lot of professional photographers who will actually come in um, to the hospital in these situations, and they will take beautiful pictures of these babies um, and create keepsakes for um, the parents. You know, let the siblings, um, let them, you know, if it's possible, let them be involved with the grieving process because depending on the age of the sibling, you know, it's a, a loss they need to actualize as well. Be respectful of spiritual um, and cultural needs and wishes of the parents. We have to remember this is their child and their loss, and we don't need to impose on them what we want to do. We want to help them enact the steps um, to grieving that they want to do. Um, being giving information to the family of bereavement support groups, if there are any local um, community chapters or groups. Um, you might want to give them the phone number, contact information. If there's a clergy in the facility, um, you can offer, even if it's a different um, spirituality um, and denomination, sometimes just having the presence of the clergy can be very soothing. You can't presume to know who the woman is going to want with her um, when she is going through this process, so you need to ask her. And she may want somebody that you just seen like coming out of left field, but if that's who she needs to be able to get through this, then that's who you're going to have. Um, you know, be respectful and considerate when it's time for um, these families to go home. They may have come in um, loaded down with baby stuff they're not going to be leaving with the baby. So, you know, think about the kind of um, care, maybe the location where you're going to put her, you know, um, don't have her housed in a room that's going to be close to where a nursery may be or next door to a woman with an active, you know, and crying infant. The post-mortem care for the, the fetus, and then, or the neonate, you need to be respectful. Um, you know, you will clean it, you will dress it. Um, typically, we will keep um, the entities in the morgue. And if mother or father wants to see it, then we bring um, the baby into the room. Sometimes um, places have been known to even um, wrap the baby in a warmer blanket. Um, something to try and bring the skin temperature back up to um, a non-chilled degree just to kind of help the parents transition through this. So it, nursing interventions when you're dealing with a loss is going to be hard. Be supportive of the parents, um, follow their wishes, and when it's all said and done with, take care of yourself too because it's, um, it's a loss for you. And if you see enough of them, it becomes very, very draining and hard um, physically and emotionally. So you need to make sure that you take care of yourself. Um, use your support resources as well. So that ends um, Chapter 24, The Newborn at Risk. If you have any questions, um, bring them to class on Monday. Thanks.